Okay, so for this demo of the um, Sprawl Trilogy ebook, I wanted to begin by showing how I'm doing this. Uh, so you can see here on the screen uh, is a recording of me talking right now, I'm basically just activating the front mounting camera of my iPad Air. And the reason why I wanted to start off with this is to show how uh, I use these different tools together, not only the iPad Air, which I recorded or have saved um, an image of the instruction um, sheet for uh, the ebook software that I'm going to be showing you, but also so that uh, you can see that I'm using glass to record the experience uh, and uh, show it to you now on YouTube. Uh, but I think it bears uh, thinking about how we use these different technologies together, how we can use these technologies together uh, to enrich our research, uh, to uh, work through um, their deeper meaning and also to, to um, gather the, the data that we can incorporate into our work uh, to write about, etc. cetera. Uh, but also how uh, these different technologies lie on a continuum uh, that they've evolved uh, over time to be this way, uh, sometimes with uh, evolutionary disasters, sometimes with evolutionary dead ends. Um, but in small and large ways, these technologies have led to this newer stuff, which is like you know this uh, iPad Air and, and the Google Glass. Um, but I think it, it's also useful for us to return to vintage computers uh, and vintage computing software to see the things that might still inform what we're doing today or give us new inspiration or new ideas for things that we're doing today. Um, sometimes uh, it can be easy to think that everything that's, that's followed in the past uh, that we're no longer pursuing or no longer thinking about um, is invalid or not, not useful. And I don't think that's the case. I think it's important for us to return occasionally uh, to the things that have come before. Um, otherwise, they, they could be lost. They could um, have terrific insight into solving a problem we have today. Um, it's only a matter of us, you know, uh, re-seizing them and thinking about how we can incorporate into our, our current workflows, uh, our current approaches to technology. Uh, so with that said, let's turn our attention uh, to the computer that I have here um, so I can show you um, the ebook software for William Gibson's first ebook. So I'll bring up um, the instruction set here. This is the instruction set from the packaging uh, of the ebook. Uh, by the Voyager company uh, as it had come out in 1992. Uh, and then as you can see here, I obtained uh, this copy from the Michigan State uh, University Library through Interlibrary Loan um, some time ago. All right, so looking at the computer that we're going to be using for checking out uh, the ebook, this is a Macintosh um, PowerBook 145. Um, it was uh, supplanted by the PowerBook 145B, which was my first laptop uh, when I was a freshman student at Georgia Tech. So to turn on this particular computer, the power button is right here on the back left. I hope you can hear the sounds that the PowerBook is making. You should hear chips and chirps from the hard drive. And you can see here I have the brightness and contrast control. So I'm going to change these slightly just to make sure uh, that we can see the screen as well as possible. There we go. Uh, so it has you know, a monochrome uh, bitmap screen. And uh, this particular uh, power book has a 6830 processor with no floating point unit. Uh, this one has 8 megs of RAM, uh, which I believe maxes out how much RAM that this model can, can have has a three and a half inch floppy disk drive over on the side. It has an 80 megabyte hard drive, um, you know, massive at the time for a portable computer, and then a removable battery here. And if you noticed, even just that short bit of time, the um, brightness and contrast went out just a little bit. Um, and it's something that these models are prone to with these controls um, after they've you know, aged uh, as much as they have. Um, but you know, considering that, obviously the computer is running, which I think is um, a tremendous triumph. Now, right now we're at the desktop. 
Uh, this is System 701. So I'm going to go to the Apple menu and about this Macintosh. You can see System Software 7.0.1. Um, currently, with virtual memory, it has 13 megabytes of memory uh, with, with 8 megabytes of physical RAM. And if we go into the hard drive, uh, you can see that currently I've got uh, 23 and a half megabytes of um, things taking up space and uh, just over 50 megabytes available. Um, so there's not a whole lot on the, the hard drive at this point. I recently wiped uh, or nuked and paved the machine and reformatted the hard drive and did a fresh install of System 701. Um, and the only software that I've installed since then uh, is Tetris, HyperCard Player 2.1, SimCity, and the Gibson eBook. Now, the Gibson eBook comes on a floppy disk, a three and a half inch floppy disk, uh, as this Gibson.sea uh, self extracting archive. And when you extract it, it gives you this Gibson folder. So I'm going to double click on that. And inside the Gibson folder, we have a number of files here. You can see the uh, by the titles of uh, the different um, novels, we have Neuromancer, we have Count Zero, we have Mona Lisa Overdrive, uh, we have a suitcase of fonts uh, for the ebook, we have this thing called Notebook, and we have uh, the library. Now, library is what gives us access to um, the novels, and uh, in addition to this, uh, which is an afterword uh, by William Gibson that's only available in this ebook, which is the primary reason uh, I needed to access this while I was writing my dissertation and which began my um, work with uh, vintage computing um, with my retro computing lab, which I've written about on my blog, dynamicsubspace.net. Um, let's go into the library. I'm going to double click on that. This launches um, a HyperCard player application which is um, the, the ebook uh, software. This is what gives us access to uh, the three novels, including um, and the afterword uh, that Gibson wrote specifically for this. Uh, so you can see, you can move your mouse around and, and choose which um, novel you'd like to go into. In this case, I'm going to click on Neuromancer. Now I have to say that uh, it's not quite as fast as uh, iBooks or Kindle, but considering the, the time and how new this whole idea was, it's pretty incredible um, that these eBooks were made available on floppy disks so that you know travelers or um, students or anybody that had a computer would be able to read these things on a computer screen. You know, I think it's kind of obvious it's, it's kind of interesting as well to think that this novel, Neuromancer, which was originally written um, on a Hermes typewriter, a mechanical typewriter with um, celluloid keys that you know, could catch fire, um, which is about and which you know, is what was formulated on the original conception of, of what came to be known as cyberspace, the, the term that William Gibson coined uh, for um, a virtual reality um, network, much like what we think of the internet today, um, but, uh, you know, taken to the nth degree. So you can see here, uh, we have the title page for Neuromancer. Uh, this particular image mirrors that that's on the packaging from the Voyager um, expanded book um, packaging. I click, tells me this book belongs to Wintermute. Uh, that's the name that I put in whenever I, I registered the software. Uh, copyright screen, and it gives us first off uh, the contents. Uh, so I could just like you know going um, into a DVD's uh, menu, uh, automatically go to a uh, particular chapter in the book and begin reading from that point if I wanted to. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to click on part one, so I'm start at the very beginning. Chiba City Blues. And then I'm going to switch using uh, the arrow keys over on the far right to go forward and back. Uh, so this is the famous opening line from Neuromancer. 
The sky above the port was the color of television tuned to a dead channel. And I can continue reading from there uh, and arrow my way uh, through uh, the book. Now you can see that I can activate uh, the system menu simply by moving my mouse uh, up to the top of the screen. And uh, I have immediate access to the three different books. Uh, I can find things, which is, I think, the, the greatest innovation for ebooks, uh, especially uh, for a researcher, because then you can find key words and quickly move through a text uh, in a way that um, is far easier and far faster uh, than trying to work with an index, which may not even be complete, depending on how well the index is created. Uh, you can see that I can launch a tool palette. Um, this gives me access to um, page, chapter. I can find things. I can mark passages uh, with paper clips. And this gets back to the ideas of remediation, uh, thinking about uh, Jay Bolter's um, co-written book, Remediation, where uh, new technologies still try to uh, work within a certain paradigm of affordances, uh, where you know, even though we have these new affordances of the computer, um, the idea of like using a paperclip to, to mark a page uh, is something people can, can recognize, associate with, um, and so it, it's still, it's used for a while anyways uh, to engage this new technology, which doesn't need something like a paperclip. It could be something completely arbitrary and different, uh, but because people understand that the this uh, old me media form uh, old technology is remediated uh, in the new form uh, you can see um, let me bring up my instructions here um, let's see we can select style uh, so we can do plain text we can do bold text underline um, we can also click on a word and it will enable all extra search features such as the first time, previous time, next time, last time it occurs. It can show all occurrences, all in context. Um, we can find something else if we want or we can go to a previous find uh, that we might have been uh, interested in. So I mean a tremendous uh, am uh, amount of thought went into what you can do uh, differently uh, in terms of reading an e-text uh, as opposed to uh, a traditional book, a print book, um, when they were designing uh, the Voyager Expanded Book Series. And what I'm interested in is showing you uh, very quickly uh, to, to close out this video uh, the afterword uh, of uh, this collection. So let's see, we can go to Mona Lisa Overdrive, and I believe that's where we can see it uh, in the table of contents. Let's check it out. I'll close this palette. see where we can find um, the afterword. Go to count zero. Which I haven't launched yet. So we'll register that as winter mute. I think it's appropriate. Ah, 
So with count zero, we can access uh, the afterwords. Here we go, afterward, author's afterward. And this author's afterward, you can search around on the internet and find a, a text version of it. I originally found it on a Russian website, um, but you know, obviously as interesting it was, I needed to verify the thing was real uh, and also find a, an accurate citation that I could use um, for my dissertation and for any other research that I might do based on it. Um, so you can see here in the afterward, he begins 10 years have now passed since the inception of whatever strange process it was that led me to write Neuromancer, Count Zero, and Mona Lisa Overdrive. The technology through which you now access these words didn't exist a decade ago. And what's interesting about this afterword is that he continues by describing how he, the, the actual processes that he used in creating the works. Uh, you know, what technologies did he use for writing the words, uh, which began with uh, you know, a physical mechanical typewriter and then transitioned um, to uh, different types of Apple hardware. Uh, but Neuromancer uh, definitively was written um, on a typewriter. And the other interesting thing about this afterward is that how he talks about the ephemerality of technology and the ephemerality of these digital words and he, as you may know, he also explored these ideas uh, in his uh, very expensive um, other ebook or, or e poem, Agrippa, A Book of the Dead, uh, which has a self deconstructing floppy disk uh, that, whenever you run it to experience the poem on the computer screen as it's playing, it's erasing itself. So you can only experience it a single time. Um, on that given media. So it was an enforcement of the ephemerality uh, that he talks about in this afterward. Um, so this is a very quick uh, look at um, the uh, Voyager uh, expanded book series version of William Gibson's Nerve Count Zero, Mona Lisa Overdrive uh, novels. Um, it's an interesting artifact. I uh, definitely recommend if you have this hardware and have access to uh, the ebook software, you check it out. Um, and I do plan on doing more with uh, this text. I have an essay that I'm working on now um, which addresses these issues of ephemerality um, in a more modern concept where we have um, a, a gluttony of data um, that tends to overwhelm us and through its overwhelmingness leads to erasure or forgetting or loss. Uh, but that will be for uh, the future, something I'm still working on. Uh, but thanks for watching. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. Or you can also uh, find me at my blog, dynamicsubspace.net. Or you can email me, jason.ellis at lmc.gottech.edu. Thanks.